Welcome everybody on behalf of Holocaust Museum LA. My name is Michael Morgenstern and I am pleased to welcome you to our discussion with Trudy Strobel, Holocaust survivor and author Jody Seven and Maya Seven Miller. Before we begin our program today, I would like to share a few words about the museum. Holocaust Museum LA is the first Holocaust survivor founded Holocaust Museum in the United States. In the early 1960s, a group of survivors worked together to create a memorial for their loved ones who perished in the Holocaust. And this memorial eventually became Holocaust Museum LA. These survivors did this at a time when the community was by and large not yet ready to face this tragic history. Thanks to their courage and their foresight, they established the first Holocaust Museum in the United States with a mission to commemorate, educate, and inspire future generations. Furthermore, they mandated that our museum should always be free to the public, making a Holocaust education accessible to everyone. Even though we are not able to be in our museum's physical space for the time being, we are still able to carry forward their mission. This afternoon, you have the opportunity to listen to Trudy Strobel, Jody Seven, and Maya Seven Miller, who will be sharing about um, Trudy's. She'll be sharing about um, the, about Trudy's life and her experiences, as well as her artwork. Um, that she has done. And uh, they also wrote a book about Trudy's life and her art, and they will be discussing this as well. After the program, audience members are welcome to use the Q&A box to ask questions. Um, and then they'll answer as many questions as possible. And those watching on Facebook can type your questions in the comments. And again, we'll answer as many questions as possible. Thank you so much to the three of you for being with us this afternoon and for all that you've done to preserve Trudy's story and her artwork. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. We're, we're, we're very happy to be here with you all today. Um, we'd love to tell you about how we all came to meet each other and how these projects were um, originated. Uh, Maya, do you want to tell us how we all met? <laughs> yeah, so um, it all started. I was preparing for my bat mitzvah. I was 12 or 13, um, and I had been assigned a Torah portion, which was essentially just a list of names. It was a census, and I sort of wanted to find a way to marry my Torah portion to my bat mitzvah project that I wanted to do and, and to my speech. Um, and through that sort of settled that I was going to talk about the numbering of individual human beings and um, about dehumanization through that sort of those means. Um, and so for my bat mitzvah project, I decided that uh, for part of it, I wanted to share my bat mitzvah with the memory of a child who had been murdered in the Holocaust before she could reach the age of her own bat mitzvah. So I reached out to the museum and through those communications, I ended up being connected with Trudy. Um, so I went to go see Trudy. I brought my mom with me, um, sort of not knowing what I was walking into, but uh, I ended up not only hearing the story of Hannah, who um, I now carry the memory of, but also Trudy's story and seeing all her amazing artwork, which is or was displayed all around her house before um, I started the exhibition. But yeah, and so that was sort of the beginnings of our relationship with Trudy. And um, I think from that first meeting um, and seeing Trudy's artwork, I sort of knew that her work and her story had to be shared with the world. But I, again, I was like very young at the time. Um, I had no idea how to sort of facilitate that. And so I did what I knew how to do. I wrote a short story about Trudy called Trudy's Goose. Um, which I think was like our first collaboration. It ended up um, doing pretty well. It won a few awards and then was later adapted into a, a short film um, sort of about the story and, and, and Trudy and my relationship. 
And we now play that film sometimes alongside the exhibition. Um, but yeah, that's how we all met and how uh, we started sort of collaborating and becoming friends. Yes. Maybe you can add to that from your perspective. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, my dear. Well, you heard this beautiful Maya here. There was, <clears throat> they came to the door, the front door, and I opened the door and there is this beautiful Maya, the, the girl of, you see, I thought of her in a, I knew what, what she asked for to do. So I saw her in a very different way, a girl of pure loving care for others to want to honor a child that had been murdered in the Holocaust in her bat mitzvah. And there she's standing, this beautiful Maya, and holding a challah that she had baked to greet, to greet me. Uh, uh, you know, uh, my dear friends, it, it was so heart, it was so heartfelt. I could have just hugged this, this lovely girl, but I wasn't going to do that, not to scare her away. But uh, they came in and uh, uh, she, she listened to my story, my life with, with, um, uh, with Jody. J Jody uh, um, is, is an unbelievable person in that um, she has deep understanding of everything. And she saw the work, so did Maya. And Maya was fascinated with the goose story. And as she already told you, and um, and my uh, uh, Jody, we, we looked through some of the work that I had hanging up and um, explained it to them and thereby related my life to them. This is how we met. This is how we met. And when 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 we first walked into Trudy's house and we saw these these tapestries and we'll show you some pictures, but it, it will be very hard for you to understand the scope of the work that Trudy does. What, what, what Trudy has done is depict her experiences as a child survivor of the Holocaust and also the history of the Jewish people in these huge tapestries that are executed single strand embroidery th thread by single strand embroidery thread so that she can literally sculpt a face in thread and tell a story in thread. And at a, at the magnitude of which is pretty hard to imagine unless you are able to see it. So um, the the idea, I mean, first first my first idea was let's let's put together an exhibition. None of us knew how to do that. Um, that would have to wait. And uh, till Maya got a few years later, Maya got a grant and was able to put on the exhibition. And I will tell you that behind Trudy is a blank wall, and that wall is blank because the artwork that usually hangs all over Trudy's house is actually on display in its current iteration um, at the Holocaust Center at the Mirage JCC. It's been there since the beginning of COVID waiting for the public to be able to come see it. Um, but Maya was able to put together a project and get grant money and mount the inaugural exhibition of Trudy's tapestry work. There is, uh, there is on permanent display at the museum of, uh, at the Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust, a, um, an installation of Trudy's of Trudy's doll work, and um, and so you know anybody when the museum opens back up, I, I recommend that everybody go see that. It's my favorite exhibit in the museum, of course. But Trudy's um, Trudy's story begins pretty much before she was born. Um, and Trudy, do you want to do you want to talk about your life? You know. Yeah. Yes, uh, I was born in uh, Neukortitsa, a uh, kolkhoz, a um, state farm in Russia. Actually, it was Ukraine, but at that time, uh, it became USSR through Stalin. And and uh, my father, he was a um, uh, he was in in charge of merchandise going in and out from this uh, from this uh, state farm. And uh, my parents uh, were expecting a child and they were hoping for a little girl. And so on one of my father's journeys, he found a doll and that he brought home. And 
uh, that sort of was like an omen to my mother. She thought, well, it's going to be a girl for sure because this doll came home. And uh, he, um, he, in November of 1937, the uh, Stalinists uh, came and said, Vasilya, Vasilya Laboon, uh, you, you have to come with us. So he had to go with them. And of course, this was the last pogrom that my mother ever witnessed again in Russia. And uh, a pogrom is a, um, I got it out of the dictionary. It's a devastation, an organized massacre of helpless people, a helpless people such as Jews. And um, so he was taken away and then I was born in March of 1938, so just within three months. And so as soon as my mother was able to travel, she went to, uh, uh, she took, you know, she huddled me up with blankets and she went to Krivoy Rok. Krivoy Rok was the next town in, uh, that had the men's, pr that men's prison. And as she arrived there, there were just long lines of women and children waiting to see their fathers, mothers, brothers, uncles, whatever. And um, then finally it came her turn and she says, I wanna see Vasily Laboon. And well, he's no longer with us. So where is he? He is, he was taken to Siberia. And uh, uh, she, of course, understood what had happened uh, because there were several other men from this kohos that were taken away, never heard of again. So she went back to kohos and her, her uh, work orders were so different now. She had to milk 10 cows in the morning and 10 cows at night and clean the stalls. And then of course she comes home and uh, there I am, the little one. So this went on till 1942 and the Nazis come in and uh, they, uh, with wagons, wagons with horses. Uh, and uh, also they had other transportation, but for us, it was a wagon, a wooden wagon with horse, horses. And they, uh, they told mama to put, uh, to take along clothing, whatever she could, and, um, and, and food. And uh, so as she was doing that, I just huddled with my doll, with my papa doll. This, this doll, my dear friends, was everything to me, it was my, my, my papa. And uh, so our journey started to move on. It was just a long colony of, of all of uh, the different people that were picked up on the way. And I, I, I didn't know that we were gonna be taken to Loach, but it was a very long journey. And we picked, as I just said, we picked up other, uh, other um, uh, Jews on the way from different towns. And then as we got close to Loach, uh, a Nazi SS man, you can see the picture. He tore my doll away from me and I cried and I, I cried, I practically screamed. Mama said, Sha, quiet. See, see, she was so worried that something else could happen to me. Uh, because there were other people on the way that were uh, that were um, uh, hurt and and shot and murdered in before we got to Loach. So um, that's what happened with my doll, and that's a moment that I will never forget. And and um, and that is a moment clearly memorialized in in the tapestry that we just showed you, which is a very large piece of work that Trudy worked on for, for quite a long time. Um, their journey 
this like long haul that they did on foot and by wagon um, was about 650 miles. And they, it was a, a, a terrifically difficult journey, but they escaped, they escaped being murdered in any number of camps so many times. Their luck was so amazing. And I really believe that their survival was a tribute to this sort of intrepid motherhood of Trudy's, of Trudy's mom. And we'll show you a picture of, of Trudy's mom. Trudy's mom was a simple woman, a seamstress living on a collective farm in Russia who probably never imagined what a hero she would be forced to become um, in order to protect her child from the Nazis. Um, I think Masha took, we all, Masha is an inspiration to all of us because this is a woman who just dug deep and accessed every resource she had in order to engineer their survival. Um, it's pretty miraculous. But Masha was a seamstress. And so her skills became very important in, in, in the time of war and her her, her skill was quickly recognized by the Nazis. So she was put to work in one location after the next. So stitching saved Trudy and her mother from, from death in the camps. Um, and, and stitching, as we will tell you, went on to save Trudy again later in life. Um, so, so, so as Trudy said, they, they, were, they were hauled across Europe and Eastern Europe and then, and then they ended up in Lotz. And then from Loach, they were taken to various labor camps. Um, and we can, um, Trudy, do you wanna talk about that journey when you guys were, Loach was, I think for you, one of the worst experiences, but so was being taken yes. from Loach. Yes, well, the, fir the first, uh, the very first thing that happened in Loach, the w women and children, we had to undress and we were hauled into a large like gymnasium uh, size room. And, um, and I don't know what they did, but just that horrifying experience being naked, you're four years old, everyone is naked, all the children and mothers, and we don't, I don't know what they did, don't know. And then we were okay to leave again and put on our dirty clothes again. So what they did, but they called this entlausung, meaning taking off the lice. And from there, uh, Mama and I were ordered to go to, uh, to the, um, to the Jew Jewish quarter and um, uh, it was very crowded there. I don't know if we were there a long time or not, but uh, really the food was practically nothing. A, a little bit of bread sometimes, some vegetable, meat or whatever. And uh, then uh, we were told to, um, uh, to See, mother started to sew there already. It was like a, like a, a large uh, sewing area. That was the thing. My mother, when she was younger, she studied to be a tailor. But you see, she was a very superb seamstress. So her being able to sew uh, was, was very beneficial. The Nazis, the, the, this was good. But as it turned out, I could stay with her. Uh, on the journey, my sweet mother, uh, she helped everyone. I mean, you, you tore your clothes on such a long journey of time. And, um, and she, uh, some of the soldiers, she helped to repair their jackets. So she was a very kindly person. So maybe that is what happened. This is what helped that we stayed together. And uh, so then we were ordered to go to, um, uh, to go to the train station. Now that uh, you think a train station, right? But it was nothing but wagons of, uh, of, of um, 
uh, of animal, yeah, was, there was nothing there but uh, um, wagons. Oh. What, what, what would that... They were like cattle cars. Yes, thank you. I couldn't think cattle was. <laughs> Oh, I'm so sorry. And um, so as we were pushed up the plank, the, the words that were used towards us, criminal, dirty Jew is the kindest thing that we ever heard. And they were behind us with, with a, a rifle, a rifles and the, the rifle butts were used to push us along, schnell, schnell. We had to get up these planks. There were planks to the big door to enter. And, and I was on the outside of Mama. And um, uh, as, as, as we were going up, there was this German shepherd and he had his teeth open. And you know, this is practically, that's how I remember just these teeth that's going to attack you any second. And next to him were these shiny boots of this Nazi. This vision never left me. So we get into this cattle car, push, push, till it's full to the brink. No one can sit down. Uh, and the, you know, some people vomited. Okay, so it, it starts to smell after a while, but we were in there two days and we had not received any food nor water and nowhere to sit down. And you see, besides the vomiting, there were other natural things happening. The stinge cannot be believed by anyone and <laughs> except that I tell you how this was. And uh, so we arrived in a in a camp and I thought they were houses, but they were all barracks. And um, uh, we're told uh, uh, push to go and you know, to go to a certain barrack numbers, everything with numbers. And I was with mama and they said um, that we would have this, this bunk bed. All the beds were bunk beds, wooden beds uh, going up and the mattress, uh, at one time had straw, but as you can see, uh, the mattress, were, but now the straw became mush and the mattress, uh, the material was all very filthy, dirty, uh, every, everything, uh, the, the pillowcase, we had one blanket, but what is one blanket in this very cold climate? And uh, so this is, and then in the morning we were counted and told, mama was told to which barrack to go to sew. It was like a factory, lots of sewing machines. And I stayed with her. And you know, uh, sometimes the, the Nazi would stand by the door or come and check if everything was still humming along to work. And as soon as I, the door opens or so, uh, I would hide behind mama in the sewing machine. But you see, that really wasn't necessary. They counted us, but I was so fearful they would take me away. <laughs> and um, so my, my dear friends, this went from one to another, the food, uh, some soup and some bread. And the bread was black and maybe an inch high, a slice of bread. And, but when you touched it, it became a, a pancake or I should say a crepe, crepe even thinner. So I don't know what they used, but there was nothing else. So we eat, you know. And, and Judy, I think an, an important point is that one thing you learned at a young age was to remain as invisible as possible. Yes, they were counting you, they counted and they numbered all, all, you know, all of their prisoners. Um, but it was invisible, like just remaining by your mother's side, being very, very quiet, which was must have been very difficult as a small child in order to survive. And when Maya and I first met Trudy, she was a very, very quiet person. Um, this, this 
need to be invisible was something that stuck with her throughout her life. I think that Judy has changed a lot in recent years and she's very visible and we're very grateful to her for, for sharing her stories. But I think that that invisibility haunted her throughout her life. Yes, um, it, it started, Judy, when my doll was taken away. Shock, keep quiet. And it just went with me for many, many years. And through you, my dear, beautiful, two beautiful ladies that are so with me and show so much love towards me, that talking through the museum and then uh, um, that sort of helps and I'm slowly becoming a real person. This is Trudy Strobel. Well, you're a very real person, but so let's let's jump a little bit ahead to when liberation happened. You guys were freed from the camp. You walked out. They opened the gates. You walked outside, and um, the first thing you saw in the field was a flower, uh, a marguerite, which you see here. This is this is this. This is a huge work that Trudy worked on for 10 years called Final Destination, um, which uh, I hope you will all one day be able to see in one of the exhibits. Um, at very least, um, it's beautifully shot in, in the book that we all put together. Um, but one of the, the visual themes throughout a lot of Trudy's work is the barbed wire intertwined with these flowers. And that's because when they were released from the camp, one of the first things Trudy saw after years of seeing nothing beautiful, was yes. flower in the field. Yes. And they're about three inches tall, two to three inches, very tiny flowers with their white faces and a tiny little yellow center. So I picked a few and I gave them to mama. A few, not many, one or two, you know. And I gave them to mama. You see the soldier that came to the door, uh, was an American soldier. And he said, the war is over, you're free. So this is how we left our, uh, our, our room there. And you know, everyone was emaciated, they couldn't move. But my precious mama, she says, Trudela, get up, we're going to America. <laughs> you see, when she was younger, uh, there was a small opening in Russia for, some Jews to to get to America, but for them it was too late for my father and my mother. So I think her wish and to hear this, you know, um, that was all she wanted for me. And so, okay, we're going to America. He said to go down, down the road and to a truck that would take us to a displacement camp. And that that was, of course, a different kind of camp. I didn't know what kind it was, but as we arrived, we got uh, clothes and new uh, and towels and soap. And the clothes were clothes that we all still, all of us donate. And I'm sure they're shared all over the world for other causes. And, but it was something very, precious because we were clean, could put on new clothes, and we smelled food because there was a cafeteria. And food was like an obsession. I guess most of my life, I just think about food all the time, but really not in my later age now. I don't think about food all the time, but um, uh, that, that uh, sort of was with me. So the displacement camps, and they were in a series of displacement camps, um, were really, they weren't that much better from the, from the labor camps that they had been in, except there was no barbed wire and there was food, not an overabundance of it. But still, Trudy and her mother had nobody left and, in the world and nothing left in the world. They had no paperwork. They had nothing but each other. And so it was very hard for them to negotiate um, where or how they would take any next step in their life. And they were sort of a victim of this displacement sy system for many years. They were trapped in yeah. Germany. I mean, yeah. Germans and Nazis were being ferried over to the United States and excused, but Trudy and her mother were stuck in one camp or one home after, after the next. Um, 
but I, I'd like to tell the story of the goose. Um, because as Maya wrote the story, Trudy's Goose, and the story is based on something that happened in one of the displacement camps, which is something that has affected Trudy's entire life thematically, visually, in every way, in terms of her work, and also both of our lives. Um, we'll show you a picture of it, and Trudy, maybe you can tell the story of how the Red Cross came to one of the camps. Yes, they, they, they came to the this displacement camp and they brought the children a wooden box with pencils and erasers and a little toy and mine had beads now my dear friends beads I put them in my hands and I still remember holding my hands like this to mama I said mama look at this beauty I thought of them like jewels and and she saw something happening in my eyes and uh, she uh, she said, we'll make something of this. Could it be a goose, Mama? And so as it, I don't know why I said this, but uh, uh, she then uh, went and she found a picture of a flying goose and uh, took parchment paper and uh, put it on top and traced the flying goose, the outline of it, on uh, on, on the parchment paper. Now there was no, no um, uh, material to be had. So she took of her skirt from, from Russia, she, it was black and she took uh, quite a big piece of it to accommodate the pattern and uh, attached the parchment paper and taught me how to start to embroider with uh, need, of course, needle and thread and the, and the beads and how to, you know, em embroider the beads. And then she says, be sure to put the beads very close together at the neck because the, the goose needs a stiff neck in order to fly. You see, the stiff neck also meant something else, to go straight, to... to to do everything you can in life the right way. So uh, I, I, almost fin I almost finished the goose, but I didn't have some of the green uh, and the pink beads, as you can see here. So she says, we'll finish it in America. And of course, that's the first thing we did. I was then 13 and uh, it has been in my home uh, ever since, all my life, I've had goose with me. And uh, that was my first experience, perhaps as an artist, but my first experience to, to, to actually to start to, to live. To, she saw the spark in my eyes and she knew that this child is, is, is waking up. Somehow, I think that's the kind of thing I think. So that that piece of artwork, that goose, is also a piece of our collective history because that was made in a displacement camp with beads from the Red Cross. And it was it was probably the first moment where you both started to live again as as, yes. as you know whole human beings and be able to express yourself in art. And also in a way it's what launched your artistic journey. So um, as, as, as we mentioned before, it was a long journey uh, and a complicated one for Trudy and her mother to leave Germany. Um, they weren't prisoners of the Nazis anymore, but they were prisoners of pretty messed up immigration policy, not only in Europe, but in our own country. Um, they finally got out five years later. Is that right, Trudy? Yes. And, yes. they, and they were allowed, they, they boarded a boat in Bre Bremerhaven. Bremerhaven, that's Bremerhaven. Bre yeah, Hafen means port, yes. Bre in Bremer, Bremerhaven. Mm -hmm. And there, yeah, we boarded a ship called General Hahn. <laughs> and that took us across the ocean. It took six days. And um, uh, all everything, the, all the mattresses, wonderful, my dear friends, all American style, nice sheets, everything clean, the food smelled good, but 
the ocean was so nervous. <laughs> we went up and down in this, it was an army ship. And um, so an, uh, one day the captain says, Statue of Liberty. And we all ran up on deck and crying and, and just Statue of Liberty. When we saw that, it was so unbelievably beautiful. And the tears were of happiness not sad tears, tears of happiness, that um, mama felt this is a future for my child. And so I think all of the newcomers that come to our country, they don't wanna be rich or they just want a, a chance, a second chance at life. And this is how I always thought of America, My beautiful America. So, um, so Trudy and her mother settled in Chicago first, where Trudy met her husband, um, got married at a young age, raised two sons. Um, they moved to San Marino, California, uh, which is right near where we live, fortunately for all of us. And, um, <laughs> but after her sons grew up, Trudy, went into a very serious depression. She had not talked to her sons or anyone else about her experiences during the Holocaust. Her husband, who was also a survivor, never talked about his experiences. Um, their children never knew their parents were both Holocaust survivors until they were grown up. But all of that suppression um, of her past caught up with Trudy and sent her in her 40s into a terrible depression in almost a state of almost catatonic depression. And it was terrifying for her family. Um, and they brought her to a psychiatrist and Trudy wouldn't talk to the psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. um, and the psychiatrist um, in a last ditch attempt to get Trudy to sort of come out of her, come out of her state of, not moving or talking, suggested that maybe she draw her experiences if she couldn't speak about them, or maybe she dress a doll. And that, that one suggestion was like a prescription for Trudy that started her on a journey to healing. And Trudy went back and, and started to make a doll similar to the doll that had been taken from her by the Nazis um, and ended up creating the exhibit that is now uh, on display at the museum um, called Badges of Shame. And we will show you a couple of the dolls um, that Trudy created. And, and Trudy, maybe you can talk about this particular. Yes. Well, I, uh, as I put on the uh, Star of David, I asked my doctor, uh, uh, why did we have to wear the Star of David? And he, he said, he didn't know, I have to go to the Federation library, to the Jewish library and get some information on it. You see, I didn't want to go anywhere. So he was really, now when I think about it, he was uh, a doctor, of course. And uh, so I started to read about other generations of degradation. And there were 11 centuries of degradation of Jews, women that went out that you don't read about that often, but when they left their home to go and, and, and shop, whatever, whatever they had to do, they had to wear either a strange headdress or a sign of uh, it, the, the Star of David was the last sign we had. They, they were rondelles. Uh, uh, just in, in different countries, it, it varied a little bit, but you had to wear a sign to show that you were a Jew. And uh, the, uh, uh, as I thought of every generation, um, I, I felt the pain that we went through, through all the generations. And when I finished this collection of 11 centuries, uh, I took it to the Holocaust Museum. It was on the 12th floor and uh, they accepted it. You know, I was so pleased how they all turned out. It took me a whole year to do 
to do all of these costumes. But when they accepted it, uh, I, I was not stunned, but so humbled that something I made should be valued and, and to be used as a teaching tool. And it, it felt good. And, so, and I think this is sort of a testament to how good of a researcher Trudy is, and she's a bit of a historian, um, because, I mean, you all can go see this exhibition, but it's, you know, an incredible physical representation of the tools used to visually identify Jews um, with the goal of othering and ultimately discrimination um, throughout many centuries, I think, going back to, like, the times of the Greeks and Romans and and such, um, yeah. And 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 I hope you'll all get to see this exhibit. But the other, so this took Trudy a year, and then Trudy and then Trudy one day decided that she was going to see if she could draw something. And Trudy realized, without any formal education in drawing and very little formal education in anything else, that she could. She could draw whatever she wanted. She could draw your portrait, but moreover, she could do all of this with a needle and thread. And so this started Trudy's journey to depict in tapestry, not only her experiences, but the history of the Jewish people. And we're gonna show you a picture so that you can get, it's hard to see oh, on Zoom, the magnitude of these pieces, but, um, but these pieces are big. Um, and so when, when Maya especially was putting together the show, transporting these pieces was not simple. This is my car and that is an eight foot large piece that is all done. You know, embroidery thread comes in six strands. Trudy takes it all apart. She only uses one strand at a time. That way she can get almost finer strokes of thread. Um, but this, this gives you an example simply of the magnitude of these pieces. Trudy has done over a hundred pieces. Now this is this is an artist who started her body of work in her late 40s, early 50s. So this is a major, major accomplishment. Um, there's another thing that Trudy did. Tr Tr Trudy, as Maya said, Trudy was an amazing researcher. So she studies, she studies fabric, she studies the, the history of costume um, throughout the world, but especially as it all pertains to Jewish history. And while she was studying, she came across a stocking that had been unearthed in an archeological dig. And on that stocking was some um, Yemenite stitching, stitching of our, of our ancestors, techniques that had kind of been lost with time. And so uh, Trudy, you should explain how you kind of resurrected this stitching methodology so that it wouldn't be lost. Well, yes, these, beautiful stitches. They're very simple because they're so old. They go back to, I think, 600, something like this. And they're, they're so old. And at that time, they were just simple embroidery stitches used because most of the embroidery for royalty was done with gold cord that was attached as a design. So um, when I saw them, it just, they grew right into me, and and I started to use these uh, uh, stitches uh, because they are in a um, in a uh, in a parallel form. But you can turn it, and that's what I do with whatever I do, and uh, uh, I then incorporate it in almost anything, especially my backgrounds uh, of my pieces. I used. Uh, I use these wonderful stitches. So um, we're going to show you a couple more pieces to give you a sense of the intricacy of Trudy's work. This this piece here, this is the father of Hannah, who is who watched his daughter murdered in Auschwitz, and whose memory Trudy carried and then shared with Maya. Um, just look at that face. I mean, this man was a, a survivor and a poet and a father, and this is exactly what he looked like. This is the talent of Trudy Strobel. Um, 
so uh and then um we're gonna sh let's show them a picture of her son this is trudy's son paul um you can see in the background of this this is also a, a detail from a, a very large portrait of paul you can see the yemenite stitches that trudy yes. uses in the book in the back yes the you book. see you see how how lovely they look on almost everything i have not embroidered everything with Yemenite techniques in a face, you need just simple stitches to show the shadows of a face. But there you can see the, the patterns, how beautiful they are. And uh, in the meantime, I've taught, I've taught this, uh, these techniques. I love them so much. I hope whoever even is slightly interested in embroidery that they will learn them someday. And so um, I'm thinking we should open this up to any questions. Thank you so much, all of you for sharing with us this afternoon. And we do have a few questions. Um, I'm going to start with actually a comment from one of our docents. She says, I want you to know that as a docent at Holocaust Museum LA, I spend a lot of time with students at your dolls and find it a wonderful teaching tool. Um, and just again, to remind our audience, Trudy's dolls, these are uh, the badges of shame that they mentioned. They have been on permanent display at our museum for um, since before we moved into our home in Penn Pacific Park that you can see behind me. And I see that uh, we have other docents who are watching right now um, who are commenting as well and saying thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we do one question, Trudy. How did the pictures survive of your mother and you as a um, you as a young girl? Yeah, she had them with her in a in a in a pocketbook, and they sur Yeah, she always had like that was. Like at one time, my precious doll. Well, she, this is all she had. So she always held on to it, yes. And that's how they survived. And that photo of Trudy and her papa doll, that precious photo of little girl Trudy, was taken by a traveling photographer. Cause I wondered like, where, where did they get a camera um, that would just show up in various towns and take a picture. So, so that, is, that is a precious piece of history. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, where can we see more of Trudy's incredible tapestries? Yeah, so that would be the exhibition that I curate. Um, it's called A Life in Tapestry um, and it's currently hung up in Orange County. Um, it's been in Hollywood and Pasadena, um, but now it's in Orange County and it's not currently open to the public because of COVID restrictions, but um, you can go to alifeintapestry.com, which is the website for the exhibition. Um, and, and, you know, if you ever need an update about that, it will be there. You can subscribe to the email list. Um, but yes, the best, the best way to see Trudy's tapestries are in person because I think it's difficult to understand like the magnitude and the incredible artistry without um, seeing it through a computer or whatever. I think I think the best way to see it is is in person at an exhibition. And then if you cannot make the exhibition, um, the book, um, we were fortunate in the making of the book to get a grant from the Memorial Foundation for Jewish Culture and that made it possible for us to bring on a photographer, a wonderful photographer who did an amazing job and to travel to some of this work and to ship some of the work in so that we could shoot it properly. The photographer did an amazing job. And in the book, you can, I mean, seeing it in person is the best way to see it. But if you can't, the, in the book, you can, the photographs are so well done that you can actually see the thread work. Um, so my dear friends, you now have met Maya. Maya is my curator. You see how capable she is. Many times through the years as I was finishing and giving away pieces, oh, they're so beautiful. They should be in a museum. They should be here and there in a gallery. No one 
ever attempted to try to do this, but here was this precious young woman. Don't you see how she grew into my heart? She saw the goose and she pursued with her talent to get a grant of, that she included a friend in order to do the first exhibit. How can anyone say thank you to something like this? She's just in my heart. And Jody, my biographer. Oy, oy, oy. Okay. <laughs> I think someone asked about the exhibition, like, will it be traveling? Um, Orange County, by the way, is in in California. Um, it's like two hours from Los Angeles. Um, it hopefully will be traveling. That's been the plan. Um, however, it's really difficult to make concrete um, plans or predict where it will be um, just right now. But Maya has obtained other grants because traveling Trudy's work is not inexpensive. Um, because Trudy's work is massive and fragile. So, um, you know, when she first got the grant, she thought, oh, we'll put on an art show. <laughs> she was a bit gobsmacked by the, um, by the challenges. Um, but, um, but it's been going really well. And, um, and it, is, it is the future travel plans aren't set, but they will be posted on the website when everything's put in place. Thank you so much. Um, Trudy, we have a, a couple of questions for you about your story. First, how did your children react when they learned about um, your your past and um, yeah. your husband's past, and how did it influence or change their lives? Mm -hmm. Yes, my um, my oldest son John, he was going to attend university, and. My husband and I never talked about our past. Um, he lived in hiding. He, and, uh, uh, and then, of course, I was in the camps. So we never talked about this to our sons. They knew they were Jews, but we were not affiliated. I said, Hans will have to tell them something. You know, one son is leaving. And so it turned out on this dining room table, we met one day. And uh, we, we told them what had happened in our younger lives. And why didn't you tell us earlier? I mean, they, were, they, they couldn't believe all of this. Uh, I mean, you know, th that we never talked about it. And in some families, it may have been a disaster, but in ours, it was a catharsis. To this day, my sons, they worry about their mama. <laughs> Nothing should happen. And, and um, they're very proud to be Jews. And um, this is how we told them about our lives. Thank you very much. And how long, um, how long did your mother live in the United States before she passed away? Oh, many, many years. Thank you very much. How long do these pieces take to create? Uh, the, the longest was uh, what we showed you and uh, Final Destination and others took Oh, several months, depending on the size and the subject. But generally, till you develop and study about what you're going to, what you want to show about this part of history, uh, it, it took about a year, yes. But I did other things in between, like dressing dolls, making dolls. Uh, those were like little attachments that I did through that year. And yes was always a joy. Final Destination took Trudy 10 years to complete. Um, right, right. 10 years and rivers of tears, right? Right, right, right. It was very difficult to do that piece. And that's why it, it was put away all the time. I put it away all the time. And then uh, for short periods of time and then stitched again, because it's very large. Thank you very much. 
Have you ever returned to Russia or to your hometown? Oh, no, I've never returned to Russia. I've, I've seen Amishausen, the, the little village that I lived after the displacement camp. And we lived there, uh, it, it, there was, you see, they had, had to find room for us survivors. And Germany was all bombed out. So in Amishausen, uh, in, this, uh, in this town, they had an empty house and they, we were given a room, my mother and I. So when I returned, I really, I wanted to see that house. And I had read about the, this town uh, is a thousand years old and it's always had Jews, 33% most, most of the thousand years because uh, there was a synagogue and all that. And uh, the house was no longer there, but I learned that the Jews that owned this house, the husband, he, uh, he uh, was in the First World War and he became a paraplegic. So he was honored, oh, he was such a great citizen. And then uh, in, uh, I think in 44, whenever, at the very end, uh, the SS came and they sort of cleaned out everything, you know, in, in all the smaller towns. And then they told them, you, you will find safety. You buy a bus ticket, take a bus. You will find, you will be brought to safety. My dear friends, they were brought to Auschwitz. This I learned just a few years ago. And how can you forget that? Thank you for sharing this. Um, we have another question. Did you suppress these memories for all these years and then they came back when you started your, doing your tapestry and artwork? Uh, they came back being under doctor's care. When I started to do and I, to, to dress that first doll and also uh, certain moments I never forgot, as I told you, the dogs and the shiny boots and how my doll was torn away. But I didn't think about how the whole, you know, how, how I lived at that time. No, it was just, <laughs> it, I didn't think about it. And that's when I learned so much uh, under doctor's care that all of these memories awakened. And I then was in with, uh, with you, Michael, uh, much later years, but in the beginning, Masha Lohan and Marsha Giuseppe, uh, we were, uh, we were in, in, a, in a temporary museum there and starting to, uh, to, uh, to, t to share our life, my life. And um, uh, that's, that's how then uh, I could actually talk about it. I just never talked about it, nor really uh, uh, if something came back a little bit, no, no, you just don't. You, you're busy with life. You have a family to take care of, you see. Thank you so much. Um, the, this is the questions that we had time to answer, but I would like to conclude with just a comment from a teacher who was watching. She says, Trudy is a wonderful speaker and has um, so much impact on school groups. At my high school, one girl said of her, she made us feel like we matter. Thank you so much, Trudy. And we also have several people who have been commenting um, thanking you, all three of you, for this program and for the work that you've done with Trudy's story. Trudy, we have several docents who have commented saying that they use your dolls as a teaching tool for, um, for students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To conclude, I would, what if, um, 
all three of you can share something that you would like people to take away from Trudy's story and from um, this project that you have been working on for the last few years. My, my, uh, I hope that everyone will remember that we had a Holocaust and that we can never forget that and that we must, you see, that's the other thing I started to, to speak and you have to talk to continue as long as we're alive. It, the, the influence is so much stronger. Someday there'll just be books. So that is what gave me the strength to become a speaker, to relate my story and to teach children, mostly children that I speak with, uh, to teach them empathy, to never forget the Holocaust. And we have to have respect and civility in our society. And we must look out for the, um, the new anti-Semites that are around and the nationalists that we have. So we have to uh, vote as to what our conscience says because we can never ever have this again happen to a large group of people like us to be murdered because of their belief and their ethnicity. This is my message. I think for me, there is so much to be said um, about the power of art, about the healing power of art, but also about um, sort of the capacity for art to spread a message. And I think Trudy's story um, is so important because it, it speaks to sort of how big of an impact hate can have. And I think we are in a time now where, um, you know, we see history repeating itself where uh, hate has become policy, uh, national policy, where uh, people across the world are facing genocide. Um, and I think that we need to try our best um, to stand up for people and more importantly to, uh, like Trudy says, Trudy says always respect um, and to remember Trudy's story um, as, as sort of a cautionary tale. And, and I also just wanna say that personally, um, I am so grateful to know Trudy and to know her story. Um, we all go through difficult times in our lives. I can't imagine anything more difficult than Trudy survived as a child. And I think that the trauma of that, which she lived with for so many years, was really, really difficult for her to um, process in a way that she could share it. But it, and it took tremendous, it still takes, I think it's clear that it takes tremendous courage and strength for her to share the story every single time she shares the story. And so I just wanna say thank you, Trudy, because in sharing your story with me and with Maya and with everybody here today and with everybody that you share your story with, you help call for a more tolerant world and we need a more tolerant world. Well, I am very humbled to have been with everyone this morning especially with my Maya and my wonderful Jody, They have written themselves into me. Can you believe what they did for me? Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Trudy. Thank you, Jody, And thank you, Maya, for um, everything you have done for our educational community and for, for our museum and for Trudy. We appreciate so much everything that you've done and for coming to speak with us about it um, this afternoon. When the museum reopens, we invite everyone to come in person and see Trudy's dolls in person and hopefully the artwork as well, wherever it will be displayed over the next couple of years post pandemic restrictions. Thank you so much again, everybody. And um, we, we appreciate so much. Have a wonderful, happy, healthy, and safe week ahead. 
and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Bye.